So explorers like Vilma and other sailors, uh, they have courage that many people tend to shy away from exploring, right? They move away from modern life, the comfort of modern life, and dive headfirst into the things that are scary sometimes, but also the last frontier, the ocean here on this planet. I believe that the main role of explorers is to build on their willingness to go to the edge of planet Earth's wildest places in order to relay messages back to us here in society. And what I find most interesting is their fear, their lack of fear of the unknown. And instead, they, they, they hang on to the thrill and the excitement of pushing the envelope. So let's meet another explorer who brings a beautiful message via his incredible photographs and all the things that he uses to influence hearts and minds to connect the world to Antarctica. This is polar explorer and Ulysse Nardan ambassador, Sebastian Copeland. Well, Antarctica is the greatest ice reserves in the planet, and uh, as a result, it's been described uh, accurately as a, an air conditioner to the planet. Not only has it an enormous amount of ice mass on the continent itself, but it's also got the Antarctic um, circumpolar current that has for millennia regulated its, uh, its climate and helped its incidence and its impact on the rest of the planet. I'm a polar explorer, so Antarctica figures prominently in, um, in my purview in terms of adventures and exploration. I'm lucky to be handy with a camera. It's sort of one of the tools that I have in helping me communicate. I don't look at my camera as just an art tool. For me, it's more of a weapon. It has the ability to speak to the heart, which is a link to the mind and hopefully to a program of action. Beauty is a catalyst to wanting to preserve. We won't save what we don't love, so helping people fall in love with their world is a way and a catalyst to wanting to save it. So the Southern Ocean is, happens to be the coldest ocean on the planet. And with that distinction, it also has the highest capacity of heat absorption. Whilst we've witnessed a global temperature rise, the Southern Ocean has absorbed about 70% of its excess heat in its water. And this is, of course, the greenhouse gas principle. It, all of that heat is transferred into the ocean. And whilst this sort of conveyor belt of downwelling has driven these cold currents uh, down to the bottom and brought cool currents to the surface, it's looked relatively stable. However, this, of course, is a limited process that cannot go on forever because the bottom is starting to get too warm. And that's what we're witnessing right now. If we're not careful, all of that heat stored at the bottom is going to start to transfer through the water column and from the surface all the way to the bottom. This will be this fundamentally a total breakdown of the oceanic uh, life and marine food web. So we have to pay very, very close attention to the Southern Ocean. Climate has not taken a pause. We've had simultaneous heat waves both in the Arctic and in Antarctica, which is the first time in my awareness that this has actually happened within uh, my lifetime. Adding to this, we have relatively unregulated fishing fleets that are plundering the Southern Ocean for its krill population in the same way that it had historically done for the whale populations. And so now these krill, which are basically the foundational base of the food chain in Antarctica, are endangered both from climate and from humans at the same time. Humans have operated primarily on a take-make-waste principle, mostly out of convenience but also out of ignorance. But now that scientific knowledge is helping us connect the dots, understanding that we are only one uh, link in an entire natural chain and that the weakest link will essentially destabilize and potentially break down the entire chain. We need to be cognizant that the oceans have rights in the same ways that humans have rights. We need to protect those rights in order to protect ourselves. We have the ability today to implement both policy 
and to stimulate the research and development of technologies that can help us transform this system that we are part of. And if we are able to look at the future and ahead of us, we'll come to realize that this is a suicide mission to continue business as usual. So politicians today need to collectively recognize the primordial importance of ecology for the future of prosperity. When I watch explorers like Sebastian, I again, I've, I'm reminded of the fact that sailors and explorers are willing to plunge into unknown territory and bring back powerful stories for the rest of us to hear as a tool to elevate the profile of really important issues like the ocean. So I'd like to now introduce you to two other brave explorers with us in the room. Uh, we're thrilled to have Anna Lushan from the Austrian Ocean Race Project team, as well as Swedish veteran offshore sailor, Gura Krantz, joining us to talk about relationships, rights, values, and protection of the ocean. Please join me on stage. <laughs> sure, round of applause, yes. All right, sit here. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for having us. No, welcome, we're so glad you're here to give us a true sailor's perspective um, on, on our view of ocean rights. And so, Gura, I'd love to begin with you if that's all right. You're one of Sweden's most experienced and merited professional skippers that you've participated in two America's Cups, three Whitbread round, round the World races, one Volvo Ocean race, and the only Swedish skipper with an overall podium finish in the Volvo Ocean race in 2001-2002. Well done. Thank <laughs> That's you. amazing. Something's got to be wrong. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite the accomplishment. So how many times have you raced around Antarctica, and what lessons did the Southern Ocean teach you uh, during those races when it comes to human ambition and limits? Well, you know very quickly that you're up against an opponent that will, will always win. The only thing you have going for you is that if you work as a team, uh, you, you might get through in, uh, and, and also in a live shape and, and get the result. You have to take a step back. You have to be able to acknowledge um, really good skill sets in other people and work together and then understand you will never, ever conquer the ocean. It will always beat you. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, I feel like th this is a giant with its own life. And I feel like we're killing it slowly with millions of small needle sticks. And, and it's just happening slowly as, as, as it goes. And we can't really define what it is, but it's just millions of small needle sticks. And, and it's slowly killing it. That's Indeed, it. yes. Yeah. It's, it's because of our impact. I mean, you have a front row seat to seeing what humans are doing and have done in the past. And I think one of the themes that keep con continuing to rise in this conversation when it comes to ocean rights is lim limits, basically, planetary boundaries. What are those boundaries that we're crossing over currently that there's, it's to the point where, where there's no point of return, right? It's beyond. And things become irreversible. I think that, you know, when you join a sailing team, and I know you have a lot of experience as well, you joined a very ambitious youth sailing team, uh, the project, the Austrian Ocean Race Project. And already you've raced around Europe, you've completed two transatlantic trips this year, which is amazing. But yet you're from Austria, landlocked, which is <laughs> also very interesting. So what changes have you noticed from your home country of Austria that relate to climate and our impact on the planet, but also your travels as a sailor? What evidence have you seen during your crossings that are evidence that we are crossing some of these planetary boundaries. Yes, I think uh, crossing Atlantic Ocean or also sailing in the Southern Ocean is just amazing. Um, I'm living in Austria, so I grew up in the mountains. I live right next to, la next to the lakes. And uh, we do have lots of snow in Austria. The snow is getting less and less, and uh, the glacier next to my place is getting smaller and smaller, so the ice is melting all the time. And uh, I think that's also because of the climate change, of course, so that's something I can really see in front of my door. And uh, crossing Atlantics is also, or Southern Ocean, is also a really special thing there. And uh, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure, uh, are there any other things that you've noticed during your crossings um, while on board? Um, yeah, I mean, sailing in general is, is 
pretty cool and uh, really exciting and adventurous. So uh, you also see nice sunsets, you see lots of animals, you just live in harmony with nature. Um, but on the other hand, you experience and you see a lot of trash in the oceans, um, you see the pollution in the water, and that's also, these are things which are really bad and which is frustrating, um, which affects the whole ocean. And that you've noticed in, in just, you know, your lifetime, which, you know, you're very much a beautiful young person who is making difference and leading the way for the next generation to come into the sailing and, you know, community, and which is awesome. But we have to take notice of these things that are changing rapidly before our eyes. So if we were to backtrack for a moment when you were younger, what even got you interested in offshore sailing? And how does it feel to be out there on the open ocean versus being in the mountains of Austria? Yeah. Yeah, how did I get into sailing? Usually, if you're Austrian, the first thing is ask why you're not a skier. <laughs> I was a skier, so. <laughs> um, but I also got into sailing because my parents and my grandparents were sailors. I grew up right next to the lake, so I came. That's how I came into sailing. And then I did the youth classes, um, Olympic sailing classes. And then three years ago, friends of mine started the Austrian Ocean Race Project. And uh, that's how I came into offshore sailing, basically. Because uh, the sailing scene in Austria is pretty small. There's basically no offshore sailing at all, as there is no ocean. <laughs> um, so it was pretty new for me. And I knew the ocean race, but I was a small Austrian girl. You know, the ocean race is so far away. Um, and suddenly it was so close. And uh, you get so much connection with the oceans. And uh, so that's, that's how I came into sailing, basically. And wow. uh, yeah, that's we have the lakes in Austria, so there's a long connection to water, to lakes, to sea, to oceans since ever. That's awesome. And yesterday we had a chance to chat a little bit, but you mentioned that your teammates, they, they're purely doing it out of passion. It's, it's a few people came together and raised the funds, and, and you're currently working to, to prepare for the ocean race next year as well, correct? Yes, exactly. So friends of mine, young Austrian teams, team members, they just uh, founded the project. And uh, we are, I think we had an average of 25 years from the sailing team, from the sailing crew last year during the Ocean Race Europe. So that was uh, by far the lowest average. And uh, we all do it with passion. That's why we started the project and that's why we love to be out on the ocean. So it's just about passion and uh, do what we do what you want to do. I love that. The crew is an average of 25 years old. That's so awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's young. Young team. That's young team. Young, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And I'm sure you're going to inspire countless other female sailors out there, young and old. And uh, pursuing the sport, I mean, it's, it's a big endeavor. But we've also found out that the Ocean Race recently announced that uh, we're hoping to more women will be competing in the Ocean Race by 2030, at least half of the crew. That's the goal, which is very exciting. So I'm looking forward to seeing that happening. But you're leading the way, so we appreciate that. Yeah. Another amazing female sailor is Lisa Blair, who just last week set a world record for the fastest unassisted solo sail around Antarctica, beating a previous record set in 2008 by Russian sailor Fedor Kun Kunyukov, pardon my pronunciation, by 10 days. She's also the first woman to sail solo around Antarctica below 45 degrees. Incredible. On board, she was carrying the Ocean Race Science Pack to sample the Southern Ocean for microplastics, and Lisa managed to make a video for us, which we are going to show in just a few seconds, to share her absolutely epic journey. Hi, so my name's Lisa Blair. I'm currently sailing solo, non-stop, and unassisted around Antarctica aboard my yacht called Climate Action Now. I've been at sea for just over 92 days and I'll be making safe landfall first thing tomorrow morning back in Australia. I've just spent the last three months surviving and living in the Southern Ocean and for me, it's the most incredible ecosystem out there and I definitely think it deserves to have a boat. 
I always understood that Antarctica is this under-surveyed, under-understood region because it's so inaccessible to the general scientific community. While I've been surviving down here in the Southern Ocean for the last three months, I've been utilising the subsea research unit from the Ocean Race. And so on board, I've been able to have a micro lab set up where I've been able to collect ocean health measurements the entire way around Antarctica. I've been able to collect data sets like acidity, salinity levels, sea surface temperature, PCO2, which is the amount of carbon getting processed into the ocean, oxygen levels of our ocean. And it generally gives us an understanding of how healthy our ocean is and how is the ocean processing carbon. I've not only been able to do this, but I've been able to collect microplastic samples the entire way around as well. So I've now collected over 180 different microplastic samples, which are going to be getting processed by the Australian Institute of Marine Science here in Australia at the end of this voyage. I'm also working in collaboration with the Bureau of Meteorology, I've deployed eight weather research boys, which become mobile weather stations, sending back barometric pressure and sea surface temperature to the Bureau of Meteorology headquarters. And then this gets fed into our uh, weather forecast as part of the data sets to give us more accurate weather forecasts and better understanding of our ocean health. On top of that, I've been working with the Seabed 2030 program and I've been logging the ocean depth the whole way around. And then this is getting uploaded into a database which will eventually become an atlas of the sea floor in 2030 and they'll be using citizen science the entire way around uh, to log and measure the ocean depth. I've got my own campaign, Climate Action Now, which I've been running for the last five years on board my boat and you'll see the entire hull of my boat is wrapped in thousands of post-it note messages that I've collected from people in our communities. Each message is an environmental action on something that we're already doing towards a better future. And the goal of the campaign is to showcase and inspire people to take these small actions with the view that as an individual, we all have the power to create change. It just starts with one action. So thank you so much. I hope you have a fantastic Ocean Summit and I look forward to continuing to do my work as a citizen science aboard our oceans and as a passionate adventurer. Also, I think something to note about Lisa is that, you know, despite the conditions that we just saw that she was sailing in, she still had the energy to make a selfie video, which I'm like, wait a second, how do you even do that? <laughs> Here we are complaining about taking selfies on land and she's out there by herself. Anyway, just had to note that. Um, but she also demonstrated how sailors can be citizen scientists. And, and the exciting thing about the race next year is that the ocean race boats will also have the science pack, which you saw in the video that Lisa took with her to sample mi microplastics. Um, it'll be on board every boat in the, in the race. And all of that data will be contributing to very important uh, research and reports, including the IPCC. So that's super exciting. Uh, Anna, Gura, what did you think about Lisa's journey? What an achievement. It's yes. absolutely uh, applaudable. And, and once you're down there in the Southern Ocean, you realize what it takes and you understand. And you can actually see it in the eyes of the people who has been there. That's my take on it. You can actually see it in their eyes when they have experienced that humble feeling of, wow, I'm a very, very small human being, but we might make it if we work together. And, mm. and uh, we've seen the pollution, we've seen the changes, we've seen the, uh, everything from drift, net, drift nets uh, trying to be cut away from the boats until I even saw a fridge floating in the Southern Ocean An entire with the door facing up. Wow. And given the temperature, we really mm. thought hard and discussed very heavily, should we abandon racing for a while and check if there are any beers in the fridge? <laughs> but we, we never did that. We came back to our senses and, and, and uh, it worked out right. But wow. the, the, my picture, after all these years on the ocean, it has changed. And my big worry is um, that we are collecting and accumulating so much pollution and toxic material, it, it's going to jump up and bite us very, very soon. Mm. It's, it's dreadful to see what's in, what's in the ocean. The persistent pollution that you yeah, keep yeah, seeing in absolutely. the water. Yeah, that is something to pay attention to and, and another issue that we need to resolve for our oceans. But, you know, making observations like that is the beginning. It's acknowledging the problem, then looking toward what the solutions are, yeah. which is, you know, exactly why we're here today. Thank you, Gura. So, Anna, how are you feeling? You're, you haven't been down to the Southern Ocean yet, but you are going next year. Um, it's the longest leg of the ocean race. What does that make you feel? And is there any advice 
that maybe Gura can offer to you uh, as for your journey? Yeah, so first of all, I just want to uh, say congratulations to her because that's uh, amazing what she's doing. And uh, it's also nice that sailors can uh, support the science so much and uh, bring those uh, samples from the ocean. It's a remote place and uh, not everybody can go there. But uh, yeah, I'm, I don't know, to be honest, what I should expect from the Southern Ocean because you just know stories, you just know pictures and videos. But uh, it's pretty difficult because uh, I've never experienced such conditions because there are huge waves, there are just fronts passing by, strong winds. Um, it's just you, your crew, the boat, and nothing else. So uh, you have to manage yourself out there. Um, you, shouldn't, you should think of what can happen. You have to be prepared for everything. Um, so I expect a really hard and tough time there. Like Richard said before, it's a fantastic sailing, but it's also m the most scariest sailing you can uh, have. So I don't know, maybe Gunnar, he's, maybe he has some advice for me what uh, I can expect or what uh, we as a young generation can expect there. I think uh, the only advice I can give you is to say thank you every time they wake you up. Uh, when, you <laughs> when, when you're about to go on watch again. Because if you say, oh no, not again, you're hopelessly lost in a, in a, in a war with yourself. So when they, after 20 minutes, you have to be on deck for another 8 to 10 hours, you say, thank you, you know, you with a big <laughs> smile. <laughs> Finally, right. I can't be here in my bunk anymore. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will charge remember yourself. that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's all about mentality, right? You have yeah. to have pure tenacity. You can't give up. There's no choice. Where else can you go? You have to just finish and get to land. So that's, so oh goodness, you guys are so brave. I'm just in awe. But um, I think one of the main, you know, heart of this conversation that we want to get to is talking about ocean rights and your perspective, because both of you have such a close relationship with the ocean as sailors. What's your opinion on giving the ocean its inherent rights? Either one of you can take it. <laughs> It, it's, it's, a, it's an obvious one. Uh, I, I feel a certain impact of sadness uh, when I see all these uh, videos and what's happening and that I haven't been involved earlier and, or really thought about it this way. Uh, I feel um, my own shortcomings, so to speak. And, and it's, it's an obvious one. It has to happen. It has to happen quickly so we don't kill that giant with the needle sticks. It, it's, uh, it's a must tomorrow. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And Anna, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. Especially we're sailors. We're just uh, out there on the ocean all the time. Uh, we need the water. We need the oceans. And we need healthy waters. Um, so I think it's uh, for us. We live in harmony with the ocean out there for weeks. And uh, it has to be, there has to be rights to protect it. Because uh, we also want the uh, next generations that they can enjoy uh, sailing like we do, and uh, so I hope that uh, the ocean gets right, get rights, and uh, that we can protect it. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your stories and your passion for the ocean. Really appreciate it. Anna, good luck with the race next year. Thank you. We'll be rooting for you, and uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on your team. And, and Gura, thank you very much for thank sharing you. your wisdom, and, and you know, you guys just stay in touch. Keep yeah. You never know. <laughs>